A year ago, I made two videos about dark and disturbing lost media. At the time, I had no idea that they would lead to my channel becoming bigger than I could ever have imagined. They amassed a total of 6 million views. It's safe to say that these two videos basically put my channel on the map. I've decided to revisit Lost Media because there's still a few pieces out there to make a video on and because my subscribers definitely seem to want another Lost Media video based on this poll I did. Before we begin, I have to point out that Lost Media means lost, as in unavailable. I've had comments complaining about me not showing anything and people accusing me of quote clickbaiting. I can't show what I don't have, so the problem isn't me clickbaiting, it's more people just not being able to wrap their heads around what lost media is. Anyway, with that mini rant over, here are six more pieces of dark and disturbing lost media. Rob Harris was an American sky surfer. Sky surfing is essentially, as the name suggests, skydiving crossed with surfing as the person would jump from a plane and would use a special board attached to their feet to perform wild and impressive tricks as they fell. Rob Harris was considered to be the best in his field as he was the sky surfing champion of 1994 and 1995. His popularity in the sport had led to him catching the interest of advertising companies who had hired him to promote their products, such as in this picture where he is promoting Valentino's pizza. In 1995, PepsiCo hired him to perform in a commercial for Mountain Dew, which would be filmed by Academy Award-winning cinematographer Janos Kaminski. The advertisement was meant to be a parody of James Bond, presumably to tie in with the most recent film at the time, GoldenEye. In the commercial, Harris, wearing a tuxedo and sunglasses, jumps from a plane that is about to crash, diving several hundred feet before deploying his parachute. He quickly releases himself from it, and drops what appears to be several hundred feet before landing on a snowboard and riding down a mountain. The ad ends with him riding a BMX while jumping over a ditch. Of course, what's disturbing about this commercial is that by the time it had been released, Rob Harris had already been dead for several months, and it was filming this commercial that led to his death. The script called for Harris to jump at 5,000 feet, let loose his parachute to 3,000 feet, perform some tricks, then open a second chute, However, while performing the stunt, the lines of his parachute became tangled, causing him to begin spinning out of control, which caused him to begin descending at a dangerously fast rate. Seeing that he was in danger, Harris released himself from the parachute and attempted to open his reserve parachute. Unfortunately, the chute would not release in time, and Harris fell over 3,000 feet to the ground, dying upon impact. All of this was caught on film. This incident occurred on December 14th, 1995, only three days before Rob Harris's 28th birthday. A few months following the incident, PepsiCo, the owners of Mountain Dew, asked Harris's parents for permission to broadcast a slightly modified version of the ad, containing footage of Harris's previous takes. They reluctantly agreed in the end, deciding that Rob would have wanted it to be released and that his friends were looking forward to seeing it, and so were they. For a time, a rumor circulated that clips from Harris's fatal jump were included in the commercial, but this has since been confirmed as untrue, as this would have been incredibly thoughtless of the producers to have done such a thing. Several songs have been dedicated to Harris since his death, and a charity, the Rob Harris Foundation, was created in his memory. The fate of the footage has never been revealed, though it has most likely either been destroyed or confiscated by the authorities. Either way, it's incredibly unlikely that this footage will ever be made available to the public. If there's one thing all of my lost media videos have in common, it's that all of them involve a story about a cannibal. Between June 2009 and May 2010, three women went missing in Bradford, England. They were 43-year-old Susan Rushworth, 31-year-old Shelley Armitage, and 36-year-old Suzanne Blamires. All three women happened to be sex workers, leading the police to determine that they were dealing with a serial killer who seemed to be trying to be something of a modern-day Jack the Ripper, a serial killer from the 19th century who also targeted sex workers. Susan Rushworth disappeared on June 22, 2009. A mother of three, she had fallen on hard times, suffering from an addiction to heroin, 
which she had been introduced to by her then boyfriend. She had become a sex worker in order to pay for drugs. Her mother Christine stated that in the days leading up to her disappearance, Susan had begun to turn her life around and had been prescribed with methadone to help get her off of heroin. On the day she vanished, Rushworth told her mother that she was going out to buy medicine. The last known footage of her alive consisted of her getting off of a bus. A missing persons report was filed by her mother and the police began searching for her. But after months of looking, the police were never able to locate any trace of her anywhere. On April 26, 2010, Shelley Armitage went missing. A former student at St. Joseph's College in Bradford, Armitage was known for being popular and good looking and had aspirations to succeed in a modeling career. Unfortunately, these dreams were shattered when she fell into drug addiction when she was only 16. Much like Susan Rushworth, she began working the streets to fund her drug habit, though her family were unaware that she was doing this. On the day of her disappearance, she met her parents by chance while walking through town. After a brief conversation, her parents parted ways with her, not knowing that they would never see her again. Around 10 p.m. that night, CCTV captured footage of her walking up and down the streets of Sunbridge Road. This was the last time she was seen alive, as she vanished immediately afterwards. On May 22, 2010, Susan Blamires was reported missing. Like Susan Rushworth and Shelley Armitage, Suzanne was also a sex worker. She had originally been training to be a nurse when she was younger, but her love of partying and going to local raves led to her getting involved with drugs. She began working the streets at the age of 25 to help pay for her habit. This would continue until the day she went missing. After spending the night at her mother's house, her boyfriend informed her mother that she hadn't returned home that night. Her phone had been switched off and she wasn't at any of her usual spots where she'd wait for clients. The police quickly began searching for her Early in the morning of May 22nd, a caretaker in a block of flats called Homefield Court was performing some routine checks of the building's CCTV to check for any signs of vandalism or any other disorderly conduct. Nothing could have prepared him for what he would find, however. At 2.30am, the camera captured Suzanne Blamires entering the building with one of the tenants. Suzanne and the man entered the elevator and then began making their way to his flat. They went into the man's flat at 2.31am as the camera watches the empty hallway outside. Only three minutes later, however, Suzanne frantically ran out of the apartment with the man chasing after her. The situation on its own is frightening enough, but it takes on a more terrifying tone when you see that the man is wielding a crossbow, meaning it's obvious what the man's intentions are. He attempts to shoot her but misses and continues chasing her before finally catching her. He then wrestles her to the ground before firing at Suzanne from point blank range, though this happens just out of the frame of the camera. After dragging Suzanne's body into his apartment, the man comes back out and walks right up to the camera, giving the finger and waving his crossbow right in front of it. The man's name is Stephen Griffiths, who had a very troubled past. Despite attending a paid private school, he became a delinquent at a young age, and when he was only 17, he was sentenced to three years in a young offenders facility after attacking a shopkeeper with a knife when the latter attempted to stop him from shoplifting. During his time in custody, he admitted he had a fascination with serial killers and expressed desires of becoming one himself. Only three years after being released from custody, he was arrested again and sentenced to two years in prison after it had been reported that he had held a knife to a girl's throat. During his sentence, he was diagnosed as a schizoid psychopath. After being released once again, Stephen attended the University of Bradford, where he majored in psychology and received a master's degree. Part of his psychology studies involved homicide studies concerning 19th century and modern murders. Local police were concerned with Griffiths, believing he was a serial killer in the making. Two years before the murders, his hunting weapons were seized and he was found to have read books on dismemberment. This led to the police contacting the housing association which owned Griffiths' flat to request better CCTV to help capture any possible incidents. They were unable to proceed with sectioning him under the Mental Health Act due to the lack of evidence of possessing signs of psychotic illness or a treatable mental disorder. Peter Gee, the caretaker who witnessed the events on CCTV, immediately contacted the police upon viewing the murder court on tape, which led to the arrest of Stephen Griffiths. He immediately confessed to the crimes, giving himself the name The Crossbow Cannibal. Why did you feel the need to, to kill her? I don't know. I don't know if I... So, if you just sometimes you killed someone to kill yourself, or killed her, I don't know, I don't know. 
inside the issues inside me. The key evidence connecting him to the murder of Suzanne Rushworth were that traces of her blood were found in his flat. She was killed via a crossbow bolt before being dismembered in the bathtub and partially eaten. Like Rushworth, Shelley Armitage ended up in his flat, where he proceeded to end her life with a crossbow shot before dismembering and partially eating her. During the process of butchering her, Stephen decided to record the dismemberment on his phone, where he discussed in detail what he was doing. He also dismembered and ate Suzanne Blamires before dumping what remained of her in the River Eyre, which he had also done with Shelley Armitage's remains. It's worth noting that Stephen very nearly claimed a fourth victim. Just an hour after killing Blamires, he found 28-year-old Rosalind Edmondson, who was on her way to collect methadone from an all-night chemist not far from his flat. He complimented her and invited her back into his flat. Initially, she walked back with him, with CCTV footage capturing the two outside the block of flats. However, Edmondson had second thoughts, and she decided to walk back to her own flat. Stephen did not attempt to convince her to change her mind, and returned home about an hour after the encounter. Parts of the CCTV footage of Blaymeyer's murder were broadcast on television. One broadcast by NBC News shows a video of Griffiths flipping the bird to the camera, as well as trying to convince Edmondson to come inside. But while they showed photos of Blaymeyer's entering the flat and Stephen chasing after her, the actual footage of these events was never shown. Additionally, NBC News stated that they would not show the footage of Stephen dragging Blaymeyer's back in his flat, nor would any footage of the crossbow shots be shown. This was the case with other news broadcasts, likely because of the graphic nature of the murder and out of respect for Blamires and her relatives. Thus, the full CCTV tape, while recovered, will likely never be shown to the public. At some point following the murder, Stephen Griffiths ended up losing his phone on a train. It ended up in the possession of a few people who were able to view the footage of him butchering Shelley Armitage, and the phone was even sold at one point before it was handed over to the police. The phone remains with the British court system. Considering the extremely graphic nature of the footage and out of respect for the victims and their relatives, it's extremely unlikely that this media will ever leak to the public. The Mont Blanc Tunnel is a highway tunnel between France and Italy that runs between the Mont Blanc, the tallest mountain in the Alps. It's mostly used to transport freight between the two countries, as it reduces travel time significantly. The tunnel was officially opened on July 16, 1965, with traffic being allowed through three days later. The tunnel underwent extensive modernization works in 1990, including the addition of safety features such as new video surveillance cameras, eight pressurized emergency shelters, a sprinkler system, and other safety maintenance. In 1997, a fire detection system was installed along with centralized safety equipment management and new variable message signs. With the sprinkler system and fire detection system, the odds of a large fire breaking out and spreading out of control should have been slim. But as you no doubt guessed from the title of this segment, this was not the case. On March 24, 1999, at around 10.40 a.m., Gilbert de Grave, a 57-year-old Belgian delivery truck driver was transporting a delivery of flour and margarine and his route was to take him through the Mont Blanc tunnel. Almost immediately upon entering the tunnel, the drivers passing de Graaf's truck on the other side noticed white smoke rising from the cabin and flashed their lights to alert him of the danger. At about 10.53 a.m., de Graaf decided to stop about six kilometers into the tunnel with the intent to grab a fire extinguisher and put out the blaze in the cabin. Suddenly, the truck erupted into flames, forcing de Graaf to retreat and run towards the Italian side of the tunnel. One of the other drivers in the tunnel raised the alarm a minute after the truck burst into flames. Over the next few minutes, as the fire continued to rage, smoke began to cover almost half a kilometer of the French side of the tunnel. During this time, drivers from both ends attempted to turn around. A CCTV operator in the Italian control room saw the vehicles attempting to escape and used the tunnel's ventilation system to pump in fresh air in an attempt to aid their escape. This proved to be a terrible mistake, however, as pumping more air into the tunnel only helped the fire grow, spreading more smoke throughout the tunnel. Any vehicles caught in the path of the smoke became unable to move, as their engines stalled due to lack of oxygen. This included fire engines, which, once affected, had to be abandoned by the firefighters. Ultimately, because the smoke was traveling slowly towards the Italian side, it allowed everyone from that side to survive, including de Grave. However, 
nobody on the French side had a chance to be rescued because the smoke contained both carbon monoxide and cyanide, resulting in most either perishing in their vehicle or being overcome by toxic fumes after trying to flee by foot. Firefighters entered the tunnel from both ends but could not tackle the blaze, primarily due to the dense smoke and exploding shrapnel. One French fireman died after having been overcome by the tunnel's fumes. In total, the fire burned for 53 hours and reached temperatures of 1000 degrees centigrade, mainly because of the margarine in the trailer. This made the trailer the equivalent to a 23,000 litre oil tanker. Fire spread to other cargo vehicles nearby that also carry combustible loads. The fire trapped around 40 vehicles in dense and poisonous smoke. In total, 39 people died from smoke inhalation. The disaster led to heavy criticism of the Mont Blanc tunnel system, including the CCTV cameras, which not only were criticized as being inadequate for capturing useful footage, but led to decisions from the tunnel operators that contributed to the disaster. Some CCTV footage was included in the 2012 French documentary, The Fire in the Mont Blanc Tunnel, with permission from the French courts. Some of the clips include a truck stopping before it jump cuts to the area being completely on fire, an emergency van entering the darkness caused by the black smoke, and various instances where smoke and flames made it impossible to see anything of interest from the cameras. However, key moments such as the truck exploding and the vehicles attempting to turn around that led to the fatal decision to pump fresh air into the tunnel were not included in the documentary. The fact that the documentary stated that it had received permission to showcase the footage indicates that the French court system does indeed hold the uncut CCTV tapes of the disaster. However, considering that the disaster has already been explained and out of respect to the victim's relatives, it is unlikely that the full tapes will ever see any kind of official release. Miche Ban Cha was an actor from Thailand who is often regarded as an icon of the country's cinematic golden age. Born in 1934, he grew up in poverty as the son of a police officer father and a greengrocer mother. Despite their lack of money, his parents were able to enroll him in a Thai boxing school as a teenager, and he would go on to win several lightweight division titles. After finishing secondary school, he studied at Prankong College. He was then accepted into the Royal Thai Air Force Aviation School, where he trained as a pilot. After graduation, he worked as a flight instructor at the Don Muang Royal Thai Air Force Base. He starred in his first film in 1956 after his friend showed his picture to the editor of a movie magazine which caught the eye of the makers of the film Tiger Instinct and his career took off from there. While he is largely unknown outside of Thailand, in his home country he was a borderline superstar starring in nearly half of the 75 to 100 films produced yearly by the Thai film industry at his peak. He remains best known in Thailand for his numerous films with Thai actress Pechara Chawarat with the pair first appearing together in the 1961 film Love Diary of Pim Chawi, before later going on to make around 165 films together. His popularity would continue throughout the 60s and he looks set to carry this momentum over into the 70s. However, this would sadly not be the case. In 1970, production began on the film Golden Eagle. The film was notable at the time of its production for being the first film that Mintai himself produced and directed, as well as for featuring the return of Red Eagle, a popular mass crime fighter character played by Mita, who had previously appeared in the 1959 film Gangster Lord. On October 8, 1970, as part of the final day of shooting, a scene was to be shot for the film's closing sequence, in which Red Eagle climbs upon a rope ladder hanging beneath a helicopter being flown off into the sunset in true action hero fashion. However, when it came time to film the scene, the helicopter flew too high above the ground for the rope ladder to be properly climbed upon, with Mitai only being able to reach the bottom rung of the ladder with his hands. Mitai was left dangling above the ground, with nothing but the bottom rung of the rope ladder to hang onto. The helicopter pilot was unaware of this and thus allowed the helicopter to continue its ascent, with Mitai eventually losing his grip and falling to the ground, being killed instantly upon impact. As the cameras were filming the entirety of the helicopter's ascent, Mitai's fall to the ground was caught on camera. When the film was initially released in theaters in 1970, the decision was made to include the footage in the final cut. However, in what fashion this was incorporated remains unknown. But when the film was released on DVD in 2005, the complete footage of Mitai's death was removed, with the film cutting away after the helicopter begins to take flight. 
The footage of Matthias fall was instead replaced with further footage of the helicopter followed by a text scroll commemorating his life. Since then, no footage of Matthias falling has made its way to the public. Those who may be in possession of the footage will presumably also be unlikely to release it in order to pay respect to Matthias memory, leaving the footage of his death unlikely to ever be released. Albert Fish was an American serial killer, cannibal, and rapist. He is known to have killed at least three children between 1924 and 1932, though he also claimed to have killed children in every state, leading to the belief that he may have had over 100 victims, though it is of course unknown whether Fish was actually telling the truth. Born on May 19, 1870, Fish led a troubled early life. He confessed that when he was only 20 years old, he had begun prostituting himself in New York City and had begun to molest young boys. His sexual deviancy only worsened over time, when upon viewing a waxworks museum that showcased a bisection of the male genitalia, Fish began to desire committing sexual mutilation. His first known victim was Thomas Keaton, who was 19 years old and mentally disabled. In 1910, Fish, after seducing Keaton, lured him into a farmhouse, where he proceeded to torture him. While Fish originally intended to kill Keaton, he decided to spare him because he was concerned the hot weather could lead to his exposure. It's not known what happened to Keaton after that, as Fish himself did not seem interested in his fate. Over the 1910s to the 1920s, Fish also began to develop a fascination with cannibalism. This would lead to the murder of nine-year-old Francis McDonnell on July 14, 1924. After being reported missing by his parents, a search ultimately led to the body being discovered in a forest not too far from his home in Stanton Island. An autopsy revealed that he had been actually abused and strangled with his own suspenders. Despite McDonald's friends claiming to the police that a man suspiciously similar to Fish had taken the boy, the murder at the time remained unsolved. On February 11, 1927, four-year-old Billy Gaffney disappeared in Brooklyn after playing with his friends, the Beaton brothers. Billy Beaton, aged three, had also vanished but was found on the roof of the apartments that he, Gaffney, and his 12-year-old brother, who had left to enter his apartment, were playing at. Beaton claimed that, quote, the boogeyman took him, when asked regarding Gaffney, leading to Fish also being dubbed the boogeyman. The body of Gaffney has never been recovered, although a letter by Fish details the boy's fate, with Fish claiming that he gagged and mutilated his victim before proceeding to kill and cannibalize the boy. A year later, on May 25, 1928, Fish responded to a New York World edition advertising the services of 18-year-old Edward Budd with the intent to murder Edward. However, despite promising to hire Budd and a friend of his when he met them in Manhattan, Fish did not show up, although he promised to do so later in a telegram sent to them. When he arrived, he decided instead to focus his intentions on Budd's nine-year-old sister Grace, luring her into his grasp by convincing her parents to let him take her to a niece's birthday party. Once assured they were alone, Fish proceeded to choke her to death and cannibalize her. In an attempt to avoid detection, Fish wrote an anonymous letter to Bud's parents, claiming that a friend of his, Captain John Davis, had cannibalized multiple children during a famine in Hong Kong. He wrote that he was so convinced by Davis's claim that human flesh tasted good that he proceeded to abduct and kill Grace to find out, admitting he had eaten her entire body. The letter led to Fish's downfall. As the police investigation of the envelope that the letter was delivered in found that it was actually sent from New York Private Chauffeur's Benevolent Association. The resulting investigation led police to Fish, where he confessed to murdering Bud. He would later also confess to the murders of Francis McDonnell and Billy Gaffney. His further confessions led to him being branded as the most vicious child slayer in criminal history by the New York Daily Mirror. Despite Fish pleading insanity, with his attorney, James Dempsey, defending him by noting how Fish was deemed insane and had various sexual abnormalities, he would be found guilty of his crimes and was sentenced to death via electric chair on March 22, 1935. He was executed on January 16, 1936, aged 65. While his letters confessing to the murders of Gaffney and Budd emphasize his twist in mind and can be easily viewed online, his attorney revealed that he had also written several notes in the hours leading up to his execution. Very little is known about the contents of these notes, as Dempsey refused to release them publicly, and they have remained locked away to this day. The only people to know what was written on these notes were Fish and Dempsey themselves, and with both men now being long dead, speculation over the contents of these notes continues to arise. Based on Dempsey's comments to the media surrounding releasing the notes, 
the note's contents were deemed too obscene for public viewing. While he did mention the notes to form Fish's final statement, he was adamant that the document would be locked away, stating, quote, I will never show it to anyone. It was the most filthy string of obscenities that I have ever read. As of today, it's unknown whether the notes still exist or if they were destroyed by Dempsey. Either way, due to how much time has passed, it seems extremely unlikely that these notes will ever be made available to the public. Luby's is a chain of cafeteria-style restaurants that operates in the state of Texas. Despite a significant financial hit in the wake of the COVID-19 pandemic, over 40 locations currently stand as of April 2022. In 1990, Luby's branched out into the city of Killeen. The restaurant became popular with older crowds and those who went out to eat during the lunch breaks. On October 16, 1991, the restaurant was packed for Boss's Day. By noon, an estimated 120 people, both diners and employees, were inside the building. At 12.39 p.m., George Hennard, a 35-year-old former merchant marine, drove his 1987 Ford Ranger pickup truck into the cafeteria. Believing that it was an accident, numerous patrons ran to Hennard's aid and to help those that had been knocked over during the crash. As people approached the driver's side door, Hennard opened fire with a Glock 17 semi-automatic handgun. He proceeded to exit his truck and shoot and kill 22 people while injuring 20 others. During the ordeal, a toddler began flailing and screaming in her mother's arms. Hennard allowed the two to leave, but killed the toddler's grandmother when she tried to escape with them. Tommy Vaughan, a local mechanic, threw his body through one of the back windows, giving an opportunity for several patrons to escape. Three police officers rushed into the restaurant and attempted to flank him. After being shot twice, Hennard ran to an alcove that led to the bathrooms, falsely claiming that he had a hostage. Hennard exchanged gunfire with the authorities before he was struck by another bullet. The entire massacre lasted just 12 minutes. His motives remain unclear, though he had a history of drug use, sexual violence, and failed relationships. His ex-roommate said that Hennard thought of women as snakes and made derogatory remarks about them, even after fights with his mother. Survivors noted that he had stepped over several male patrons in order to purposely execute the women. As he began shooting, Hennard repeatedly screamed, all women of Killeen and Belton are vipers. This is what you've done to me and my family. At one point during the massacre, he taunted a victim, saying, hiding from me, bitch, before shooting her at point blank range. Immediately following the massacre and Hennard's death, the police filmed the crime scene, with all of the bodies still laying where they were when they were killed. They were tagged by placing green dining napkins over their faces, which were removed before filming began. It should be noted that some of the victims were turned over onto their backs for proper identification. A majority of the bodies seen in the walkthrough were not in these specific positions when they were murdered. Clips of the footage were shown to the public in the 2008 documentary, Going Postal, 15 Shocking Acts of Violence. More footage appeared in December 2017 during an episode of Copycat Killers. The latter broadcast showed more graphic aspects of the walkthrough while censoring the faces of the deceased. In 2016, a Reddit user claimed to have viewed the footage firsthand during one of the criminal justice courses in Bell County. They said, the videographer entered the restaurant through the same path of the perpetrator's vehicle and began to pan to the left where the line had been formed. They went from victim to victim, documenting their location. The investigators had taken the state IDs and driver's licenses of the deceased and laid them on top of their chests to note their name and location. They had already turned over all of the victims so that the videographer could get a clear picture of their face. It was eerie, but effective. Considering that this story was shared before the extensive footage was shown, this user appears to be telling the truth, adding to the potential fidelity of the video's contents. It's unknown how long the walkthrough footage is in terms of runtime. Given that the picture shows investigators examining Hennard's truck at night, the walkthrough is probably several hours long. One explanation could be that another video was recorded solely for evidence collection. As of April 2022, the footage is currently believed to be in the hands of the Killian Police Department. It's unclear if copies of the walkthrough exist among former investigators, though this is unlikely as it wouldn't make sense for the police department to allow individual officers to keep their own copies. Though at the very least it would seem that more than one police department has a copy of the footage, though the odds of them sharing this footage with the public are probably slim to none. Many images of the crime scene exist, 
but the majority of them are too graphic to show on YouTube without risking this video's monetization. So obviously, I can't put them in this video. So I guess, sorry to blue bore you, gore lovers. And that's the end of the video, folks. I think this may be the last lost media video I make, at least for quite some time. I know I said these types of videos are what put my channel on the map, so to speak, but I feel like I may have covered all the examples that I find interesting. The majority of the remaining examples I can think of are either media that's been found, or mostly gory, banned movies that might be scary to watch, but are ultimately just movies and not really not safe for life. Anyway, I hope you enjoyed the video. I know it took a pretty long time to come out and wasn't nearly as long as my last video, but I hope it was at least worth your time. Speaking of my last video, something pretty cool happened regarding it a few weeks after it came out. It was actually given a shout out by two famous individuals, one of which found the video due to their association with the wrestling business. This was actually really cool for me because I actually have fond memories of watching them in the dying days of WCW. The company was a dumpster fire by then, but these two were always pretty entertaining. I'll leave you now with a clip from the Twitch broadcast where the shout out happened. Thank you very much for watching, be sure to like the video, leave a comment and subscribe if you're new, and I'll see you all next time. Much motherfucking wicked clown love. Um, I saw this thing on YouTube called um, the 10 evilest wrestlers. Oh man. Okay. Yeah, that took a fucking laugh. And, and I thought when it was coming out, I'm like, oh, this is going to be corny as hell. They're going to be like, oh, Roddy Roddy Piper was a bad guy. You know what I mean? I thought it was going to be like gimmick style. Oh, yeah, okay. But That's what man, I thought you were it wasn't gimmick style. So it was like the real shit. life. Yeah. Okay. And it was full of shit I had no idea about. Uh huh. <laughs> like, right. out of all the wrestling shit we know. Yeah. I had no fucking clue what they were talking about, and it's all real. Wow. Okay, like, th like there's one, one lady was a luchador in Mexico, and mm -hmm. she ended up killing literally 100 people. Like, she was killing old people. She was going to their house. Oh, oh, I thought you meant in the ring. I'm like, no, no, no. She was going to this after she retired. So she, she was, was serious. She was mother going fucker? to their house, fronting like she was a social worker from the... From okay, the so she was a retired lucha. Yeah. Okay, but still, she's a fucking and she murderer. She was going to their house, acting like she was from the something. Yeah. You know, and they were letting them in, the and she would choke them out and then rob their house. You gotta watch <laughs> this shit. Okay, I'm good. The for ten sure. evilest wrestlers because they cover it in depth and they fucking school you. Like I thought I knew everything about everything yeah. wrestling. Dog, I didn't know any of these stories they were yeah. telling, and they're next level shit. No, because I'm the same way. Like, I say, yeah, I, I would love to watch that because I'm the same way, and I like to get it's, school. It's with really that shit, interesting man. shit, man. Yeah, for sure. You know, really next level shit. You know, yeah. shit. Like, I'm, I thought I had low expectations. I'm not gonna lie. Yeah. But like Bobby man, the Weasel, it was heated. very informative was and dick. really fucking, really real fucking good, man. And it's hard to believe out of all the wrestling specials and shit on YouTube, nobody's talking about the shit. He was covering. But they're all Absolutely. motherfuckers that are just evil. Yeah. Like, hey, they know they that, do. you know, they're smart about you hiding Hitlers it, that and whatnot, they killed yeah. somebody and shit. Oh, like that. And these yeah, wrestlers are, are fucking crazy, man. You watch it and you'd be like, damn, I had no idea, man. Really interesting shit.